The universe is fundamentally made of random events full of uncertainties, but many things in our lives aren't seemingly so. Behind many science concepts, there are concrete observations. Every time you throw a ball at a flat wall, for example, assuming with equal intensity, you can say with certainty that it will bounce back the same way every time. How does a seemingly random universe create something seemingly concrete and certain? Well, let's visualize this through a game. Imagine there are three points on a piece of paper that form an equilateral triangle with sides 1, 2, and 3. Pick any random point within this triangle and go to a random number generator that will spit out the numbers 1, 2, or 3. If you land on 1, for example, take this point and draw a line between it and side 1. Take the point straight in the middle and draw a new point there. Let's say we now get a 2. Well, take this point and do the same. Draw a line between this new point and side 2 and mark out the point in the middle. We'll repeat this process over and over. Here's the first 100 or so points marked out in the simulation. Here's the first 1000 and the first 10,000. Notice the interesting shape that comes out of this seemingly random sequence of events. You realize that the more and more you play this game, the more and more the resulting shape resembles a well-known fractal, the Sierpinski's triangle or the Sierpinski's cascade. The obvious question here is, why? Why should a shape like this appear out of a seemingly random series of events? Where does it come from? Well, throughout this video, we will explore this question, whilst picking up some knowledge to help you navigate through the world of fractals along the way. Let's first delve into how one builds the Sierpinski's triangle. There are traditionally two ways to do this. The traditional method is quite simple. We take an equilateral triangle like so. We drop the center of the triangle, and do the same for the smaller triangles. If we repeat this process infinitely many times, we will eventually end up with the Sierpinski triangle. With the rise of computers though, another matter has cropped up. Imagine we have a machine. Let's call it machine A. What this machine does is take a shape as an input. Then when we put it through the machine, we make three smaller copies of itself, each of which is twice as small as the input shape, as shown. Let's try another shape this time. As we go on to infinity, we notice that the shape that comes out of this is the Sierpinski triangle itself, no matter what shape we put in. Mathematicians call this shape the attractor of machine A. Why? Well, because no matter what we put into the machine, when we do this infinitely many times, it will always tend to this specific shape, kind of as if it is attracted to the Sierpinski triangle. One important thing to know about this machine is that when we put Sierpinski triangle into the input, the triangle itself will appear on the other side. This is because, well, the triangle is in fact a smaller version of itself due to the infinite nature of its construction. Which brings me to my next point. In this video, we won't be necessarily touching on what exactly fractals are, but we are going to focus on the characteristic that is common amongst most fractals, especially amongst the more traditional fractals such as the Sierpinski's triangle. This characteristic is self-similarity. Simply put, Self-similarity is what happens when a shape is a smaller version of itself. We can see this happening within the Sierpinski's triangle and most other classical fractals really, such as the Cox snowflake over here. This is the reason the Sierpinski's triangle works as an attractor under machine A earlier. If it can be a smaller version of itself, then absolutely it can be a bigger version of itself. If you think about it, a ruler is an attractor in its own right. If we put it in machine B, for example, which scales it down 10 times and copies it 10 times, you won't get a copy of the ruler again, or rather, at least something that looks like it. Let's say you have a meter ruler whose smallest reading is 1 millimeter. That is, the ruler has 1000 markings on it. Let's say you want to approach the number 457. This number, by the way, we will rewrite as 400 plus 500 divided by 10 plus 700 divided by 100 for simplicity's sake. You will see why later on. Well, how would we approach a number like this? Well, let's illustrate this with visuals. Let's begin by approaching the number 700. We'll start with a stick with 1000 units divided into 10 markings. And then we'll pick the 8th square, because if you think about it, the first square corresponds to the range 0 to 99. When we do this, we will get the square corresponding to the 700 numbers, or numbers from 700 to 799. 
After that, we will scale down this entire ruler by 10, and then take a similar meter rule with 10 markings. Then, attach this smaller ruler to the 500 range. So far, this strip here would mark out 500 plus 700 divided by 10. Let's repeat this again, we make this ruler smaller by 10 times, then attach it to a larger meter rule with 10 markings. Then go to the 400 range. At this point, we'll hit 400 plus 500 divided by 10, plus 700 divided by 100, or 457. Thus, this small strip here corresponds to 457 on this ruler. Notice that at this point, every time we squish the entire ruler, the number of markings increases. It started from just 10 markings, then 100, then 1000. Now, remember what we've done so far. We've taken a ruler, which we'll call A here because it is an attractor, we squish this ruler down 10 times, and then attach it to a certain range within the larger ruler after we squished it down. Let's define a function to formalize this concept. Let's call it wka, where wka equals to a divided by 10 plus k divided by 10. Yes, this looks intimidating, but let me explain. a here just refers to the attractor, which in this case is the ruler itself. We then scale down the attractor by 10 each time we do this process, and the k of the 10 term simply applies it to a certain range within the larger attractor. This we've seen in the form of the squish and apply within the ruler. For the point 457, for example, this location looks like W7, W5, and W4. So therefore, this WKA notion is simply an abstraction of this squish and apply process, much like how 1 plus 1 is an abstraction of adding two objects in front of you together. We're just trying to express this visual process in more mathematical terms. So every time we apply this thing here, just remember that this means squish and apply. Let's play this chaos game we mentioned at the start, but in another way. Let's roll a 10-sided die instead, with numbers 0 to 9, and plug in the values into the WK function each time. Every time we go to a new location, we will mark out a new point on this ruler. Let's say the first few numbers we roll are 457. Well, that's pretty obvious. We already know what that is. However, let's say we roll a 5 to get to the row 5457. We notice something interesting happened. Since we squished the ruler another time, the 7 reading becomes the reading 0.7 on the new ruler. But remember, this ruler we defined for ourselves can only read up to the millimeter. So in actual fact, we can just ignore this 0.7 at the end and focus on the point 545 on this new ruler. So therefore, this new random point will be 545. When we roll the die multiple times, we will eventually form a long string of numbers, right? In the long string of numbers that the die roll produce, this will be like dragging a slider over these numbers as the numbers in the end become too small for us to care due to it being squished too much. That is to say, for the WK function in attractors, if things become too small for us to care, we can simply ignore early iterations of this function. Now here's the question I'd like you to think about. If we roll the 10-sided die an infinite number of times, will we eventually mark out every single point on the ruler? Hold that thought. We're going to answer it later on down the road. Let's play this game on the backdrop of a simpler version of the Sierpinski triangle. This time, let's label the triangles and the dice sides LTR for left, top, and right. Let's pick this random point in the center of the triangle. Let's say that we roll a left on the die. Well, we do this process of taking the midpoint and then marking out the new point. Let's say we roll a T now for top. We'll do this process again. Let's say we roll a right and we'll do it again. Notice how we are adding more and more small triangles as we go on. This is similar to us increasing the number of markings on the ruler area in the beginning stages as we become more and more specific. Let's take a look at the current location of this point. Notice how we can get to it by going right, then top, then left. Hmm, that's quite interesting. It's almost as if, well, the dice actually predicts the new location of the point over there but reading the point's location from the right this time. Take a look at this point again. Just like the ruler example, 
This point can be reached by squishing and applying the Sipinski's triangle. This point is located at right top left, right? Well, we can take a Sipinski's triangle, scale it down, and choose a side to go to. This process will be repeated until we reach the point itself. However, this time we need to redefine the squish and apply function into something that's more relevant. So let's replace the 10 here with a 2. Recall that machine A scales down the original image by 2, and then replace the k over 10 term with left, top, and right. Since we are now applying it to the left, top, and right sub triangles rather than 1s, 2s, and 3s on the ruler. My friends, this is the key to the proof. Realizing that the die here is not so innocent after all. It is secretly giving the information of where the new point will be. And that all this is intertwined with the WK function, this idea of squishing and applying. But you may ask, how can we be so sure that this will always land inside a left, top, or right? Well, let's take this first level of the Sipinski's triangle. Notice how the big triangle is a bigger version of one of these triangles here. Let's take the top one for example. And notice how this smaller length is twice as short as the length in the larger triangle. Thus, when we take the midpoint of whatever point on this big triangle, even if it's on this very bottom, it will always map to a point on the smaller triangle. Let's talk about the points within this triangle over here for a while. Would you agree that each point here is an infinitely small triangle? After all, every triangle here can be located with a really long strings of L's, T's, and R's. But let's not get too insane here. Let's say we can estimate the location of a point with a small triangle, albeit with a certain level of error. However, this makes things much, much easier for us, because it means that there will be a point in time where we won't be subdividing the triangles further, just like how we did not divide the ruler past the millimeter point. Once we reach this threshold, when we do not want to subdivide further, we will start to cure the slider notion of this triangle. Remember, in our ruler example, each time we roll the die, we will get a long string of numbers, all of which corresponds to the WK function. Similarly, if we put all the die rolls together, we will get a long string of left, top, and right, which we can also express as a series of squishes and applies. Now remember the idea of us being able to ignore earlier iterations of the WK function as we go on after a certain level of precision, kind of like dragging a slider over the long string of numbers. Well, the same applies here. Depending on how precise we want to be, we will eventually ignore earlier iterations of this WK function. So again, in this long string of dice rolls, we can drag a slider to get to the new address where the new point will be located. So let's say we want to hit an arbitrary point. Given an infinite number of throws, how do we exactly know that we hit this point? Well, it happens when the string of letters that represents this point appears on the slider. In other words, as long as this string of letters appears in this long string of left, tops, and rights, then we know for sure that this point has been reached. Remember the question earlier about whether or not we will hit every marking on the ruler? Well, the answer is yes. Given an infinite number of rules, it will happen eventually. Well, if this notion works on one single random point, then we can be for certain that it will happen on every point eventually, right? So that's it. We've at long last proven that the dots generated by the chaos game will create the Sipinski's triangle. But wait, the more eagle-eyed of you might realize that there are these random points within the void of the Sipinski triangle. And you may be asking, well, this isn't within the Sipinski triangle, what gives? Well, to explain that, we need to take a look at a concept called space. Simply put, space here refers to a list of all the reachable points within a shape. In this case, this shape is the Sipinski's triangle. Let's look at what happens when the die is thrown through different levels of the Sipinski's triangle. This is row 0. At this point, there is only one reachable point in the Sipinski's triangle, which is just the triangle itself. So let's say that the space is A for the attractor. This is row number 1. These three points are all the possible points that the new dot can end up in after this first row. These correspond to the location left, top, and right. However, let's take a look at the central one. Not just that, no matter how many times we roll the dice in future events, as will become apparent, this point will never be able to be reached again. So, we can simply ignore it and remove it from the space. Let's get to row 2. Similarly, here are the possible points. 
Notice that we are no longer able to reach these three points again with further rolls of the dice. So, we will remove them from the space. Hence, the space is now just limited to these points. Same as before, here is rule 3. The old points can no longer be reached, so we remove them from the space of possible points. Here, we notice that after more and more iterations of die throwing, the space starts to exclude more and more of these points in the void, and after a roll happens on that level, it will never reach another void again. So, aside from a few blips from when the dice is traversing deeper into the triangle, the dice generally will not give points in this void because it is not within the space of the roll. Thus, we cannot worry too much about these void points because they do not disprove our proof. So, after all that, let's formalize it. Given an infinite number of rolls of the die, the dots will slowly cover up the Sipinski's triangle, resulting in the image we saw earlier, because the rolls of the die actually represent a traversal deeper and deeper into this specific triangle, forming a long string of lefts, tops, and rights that tell us the exact location of the next point. And that's it. That's the proof done and dusted. It might seem like a simple proof, but a lot of the concepts mentioned in this video are actually things you might learn or come across when you first enter this field of math. In the words of the authors of the main source of reference for this video, the true secret of the chaos game has nothing to do with deep mathematical results like a Gothic theory. However, let's not let a simple explanation discount how breathtakingly beautiful this unexpected result is. Let's not forget, this is order amongst chaos, and I think that there is something worth being in awe about that.